Greetings, welcome to our video program Jeevan Jyoti. Today we have one more edition of this program and we want you to be blessed by this. Today uh, we have two wonderful teachings by our senior pastor Reverend Lance Laycock and also uh, Reverend Jerry Ireland talking about how you can be excellent at your workplace or business or whatever profession you're undertaking. Probably you may be a doctor, you know, trying to cure this patient who is struggling with this complicated sickness. We want to offer Jesus. Take Jesus with you. You may have all the medical knowledge, but sometimes you're missing something. You may be a surgeon who is trying to uh, perform a surgery, but it may be very complicated. You may be an engineer who is trying to build a bridge or a house, but trying to find that their things are not really coming together. You may be a professional uh, uh, businessman and um, you may be struggling in your business to get new contracts take Jesus with in this in this teaching we see that uh, how Jesus comes along and how he multiplies uh, uh, whatever efforts we are making my dear friend you got to watch it wherever you are take Jesus in your life when Jesus comes into your life not only he saves your soul he becomes the Lord and the master of your life he gently guides you and makes you the most effective person. I want to tell you after watching this program, you will be e effective and excellent uh, in your business, in your profession, in your workplace. And you may be facing a, a boss, you know, who is uh, really hard at you. Maybe God is going to give you a wisdom how to handle that boss through this uh, teaching. May the Lord bless you. Come and watch and be blessed. All right. So we started this little mini series on, on Peter, a uh, five part series connects with the life groups. And uh, last week we started with, you can have an encounter with God during times of change. And we looked at the changes that Peter went through and other people went through with him during the time of his visit to Cornelius' house in Acts chapter 10 and the opening of the door of salvation to uh, the Gentiles. Also during that um, message last week, we talked a good bit about uh, prejudice and, and uh, division between races and skin colors and nationalities. And we talked about how the Lord wants those walls to come down, all of those barriers to come down. If you were not here last week, and I really encourage you to go onto our website and watch last week's service. And if you don't wanna watch the whole service, you can always just scroll ahead right to where the sermon starts and you can, you can just watch that part of it. But I would really encourage you to go and listen to that if you didn't get to hear it yet. And then next, next weekend, we're going to be into You Can Encounter God in the Miraculous. And we're going to look at some of the miracles that Peter was involved with and how, um, how he encountered Jesus in powerful moments. So if you need a miracle or if you know somebody that needs a miracle, be here next week. Bring them with you. We're going to take special time in the services to pray for those that are in need of miracles as we look at encountering God in that way. But today it is you can have an encounter with God at work. I got one amen. Okay, let's see. We're going to back that up. Today, what we're going to look at is the fact that you can have an encounter with God at work. Amen. amen. See, now a lot of you are just saying that because I, I begged it out of you because you're thinking, dude, you do not know where I work. God ain't anywhere near that place. Um, but I'm going to tell you, you can have an encounter with God at work. Luke chapter 5, one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, that's, that's Peter, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Now, stop right there for a second. I personally am not a fisherman. Lori, had, Lori is. She has tried to teach me. Uh, we have been many times sitting, on a boat, sitting in a boat with sticks. We've stood on a bank with sticks several times before the, there's ever any evidence of marine life. I think when, you, when I go to play basketball, at some point in time, there's going to be a basketball. So I think when you go fishing, there should be fish. But several times we went, and there was no fish. But la last year, we nailed it. Didn't we? We, we, were just, we were just yanking them out of there. What's, is that the term? 
We were just pulling them. There were several fish that we, a whole bunch. Anyway, um, but I want to know how many of you, how many of you do like to fish? How many fishermen? And, and how many of you that fish um, ever had this day, this moment right here, where your boat was so full of fish that the boat actually began to sink? How many of you? No. But how many of you have said you had that day? Come on, I know fishermen love to tell us. Yeah, you told somebody. It's not true. Fish tail. So, Moving on, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of, catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid, from now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. So just quickly today, I want to get into this and, and see how you can encounter God at work. What Jesus does is... The, he just walks onto the scene and just gets into the boat. He just gets into Peter's boat, just plops down and starts talking. Jesus can do that. He can show up where you work. He can just show up, sit down, and start talking. When he arrives, he'll, he'll make a difference. He can come in, right into your factory or into your office or your classroom or your hospital or maybe, maybe your home office, your construction site. Jesus can walk in, sit down, and just start talking. He does that. He has that ability, and when he shows up, he's going to make a difference. So my first point is simply this. Take Jesus to work with you. When you're packing up your, your briefcase, your toolbox, your lunch pail, put Jesus in there. You know, uh, thermos, check, sandwich, check, chocolate Twinkies, check. That's my new obsession. Uh, chocolate Twinkies, check, and Jesus, check. You got to have him with you. Pack him up. Take him to work. No matter what you're doing, where you're going, bring him with you, and he will make you excellent at what you do. You know this whole concept of work ethic? You know, that's our thing. That's a Christian thing. That's based in scripture. That's based in church heritage and church history. The idea to be excellent, to be diligent, to be honest, hardworking, trustworthy, um, all the things that make up the work ethic, those things are rooted in scripture. That's our thing. Um, I've noticed over the years as a preacher that when I'm getting ready to talk about something on a, on a weekend, I will encounter examples of it during the week. And, and I want to say that this week, just some different things, uh, work-related and, and also personally, I've, I've uh, been talking to a lot of different people and interacting with a lot of people in the context of their job, their work, and they're there to, to serve me or to help me or something like that. You know? And I want to say that some of the people I encountered this week were excellent. And they were wonderful and punctual and, and courteous and respectful. And some of them, not so much. Anybody encounter any not so much people lately? I mean, like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm having these encounters with them. And then later, I'm literally wondering, like, how in good conscience did you pick up a paycheck at the end of the week and take it home after what you just did to me and how you treated me as, as a paying customer? You know, and, and that's everywhere, isn't it? I've been telling people for years, man, if you can just show up, work hard, and be honest, you will always have a job. Somebody's going to hire you because the, apparently those qualities are in short supply. So take confidence and take, take hope that you will find that job that you need. So the work ethic is our thing. And you look in Scripture, you look at Daniel in the Old Testament, and, and you see things that are mentioned about Daniel and mentioned by other people. And just in the narrative of the story, you will see things like it says Daniel was excellent. And they're talking about him at his job, at work. Daniel was excellent. And it said that he was neither corrupt nor negligent, but he was very trustworthy. That's the kind of things that were said about Daniel in his context of his work environment. I love that. And then there's Joseph, way back in the book of Genesis. And, and here's Joseph, you know, sold into slavery by his brothers. And he's now carried away from his homeland. He's working as a house servant for Potiphar. And, and he does not want to be there. He doesn't want to be in Egypt. He doesn't want to be working in that house. And yet he does an excellent job. And God blesses him and promotes him to the point that Potiphar put him. He says, I totally trust you with everything uh, in my home. And then Mrs. Potiphar lies, makes up a story. Joseph ends up being thrown into prison. 
And what happens while he's in prison? He's given responsibilities and duties there, and he does them with excellence. And he does them so well that he gets promoted and honored there as well, even to the point then as God miraculously intervenes, Joseph becomes second in the entire kingdom, second only to, to Pharaoh himself. And I wanted to share that example about Joseph because there's some folks in the sound of my voice right now who are, you're working somewhere you don't want to be. And you're doing a job you don't want to be doing. You never expected to be there. You didn't plan on being there, but there you are. I want to hold up Joseph as that great example that he did a great job even though it wasn't his ideal situation. And God was able then to bless and to move powerfully on his behalf. And so whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all of your heart. Are you there today? So Peter and Andrew, James and John, they had fished all night. And then Jesus said, I think you should go back out there into the deeper water and just put the nets down there again. Now, they're done with work. They're off. They punched out. They're, they're cleaning the nets. And he says, go back out there into deep water and let down the nets again. Folks, sometimes what you need at work is a God idea. You need God to just, boop, you know, light bulb and just, and just pop that idea light bulb over your head and give you that God idea. If, you, if you're looking for creativity, may I please present to you the creator, okay? The almighty God of the universe who's created everything. I think he can come up with an idea to help you at work. He can help you to see it in a new way and, and to solve a problem and have a new idea and create something new that would be a blessing to your company and those you serve. He's creative God. He can do it. Amen. He can give you success, and he can even do it when you're done. Like I said, these guys were done for the day. They were packing up, and sometimes you're there. You've packed up. You have given up. It's just not going to happen, and yet God will spark an idea and say, hey, what about this? What about that? I believe if you pray and trust him and ask him to speak, God will give you God ideas at work. Colossians 3 is a great passage. It says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an, an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. So folks, no matter what the name is on your pay stub, that individual or that company that you work for, it doesn't matter. You work for the Lord. You work for the Lord, and your service should reflect that. If you're struggling and you're spinning your wheels, I want to encourage you to take Jesus to work with you and encounter him there. And remember that your work is part of your witness. When you go to work, uh, you are you know, witnessing with your lifestyle, um, your words, what you say and don't say. You're witnessing um, by your sharing scripture with people. But also remember that the very work that you do and the way you approach it is part of your witness. There's a lot of people that have been turned off to Christianity because they work with Christians. That's a shame. That's embarrassing. Christians should be the best employees, the most honest, and the, and the hardest working. Somebody say amen quick. All right, thanks. So take Jesus to work. And then secondly, be aware that Jesus might change your work. He might change your job. Last week, we, we talked about how Peter you know, went from being a fisherman to being a fisher of people, and he had no idea how God was going to open wide the doors of salvation for all the Gentiles, which is most of the world, most of the people that are in this room right now. That, was, that happened because Peter laid down his nets that day and started walking in a different vocation. We are all called to follow Jesus, and sometimes that call to follow includes a call to leave, something that you used to do. Because God will call you in a vocational manner, and he'll call you for your whole life. Um, in marriage, we are instructed to leave and cleave. You, you, and on your wedding day, your, your primary human relationship changes from your family of origin to your spouse. And, that, and that's, you have to totally leave in order to cleave. You have to leave mom and dad and go over here. Has anybody ever seen Everybody Loves Raymond? Okay, so you get it. You understand what I'm saying? It was too crowded in that house. And I think marriage is hard enough. It shouldn't be too crowded. I think it should be a man, a woman, and God. And those three people right there will, have, will work it out, and they will end up having uh, a tremendous marriage in that house. But it's too crowded. So we don't leave. We have a hard time cleaving. And God sometimes calls us to leave something behind so that we can really follow what he has for our lives. And these guys did it sacrificially. We just talked about this is the best day fishing ever. I mean, their boats, they had to pull those boats up on shore. They're heaped up with fish. 
I mean, there's a pile. It's not imaginary. It's not theoretical. They had a huge load of fish right there, and they walked away from it and followed Jesus. They left behind riches and wealth in order to to follow him. Some people, um, God's going to do that. God's going to speak to your heart and say, I want you to follow me full time, all of your life, as your vocation. I want you to follow. And it might be the 18-year-old. It might be the 48-year-old. It might be, and how about this? How about retirement? How about retirement? What are you going to do when you retire? I mean, how much wheel of fortune can a person watch? Come on. You have all this extra time on your hands. Many people struggle in their retirement years because they don't feel significant. They don't feel that they have a purpose anymore, that they're needed. Folks, if that's you, may I please present the world. The world is huge, and it's a world full of need, a world full of opportunity. There are missionaries all over the world right now praying that someone would get up off an orange pew and come and just live with them and help them, serving as they do in various nations. Can I get an amen from our missionary? Thank you. Thank you. Your retirement years can be awesome. Turn your twilight into the highlight. That's how it works. Have you been building? Build for the kingdom. Have you been communicating? Communicate the gospel. Have you been involved in health care? How about starting to heal people in the name of Jesus and being involved in, in medical missions as well? If you've been in engineering, why don't you get busy designing systems to help ministries function more effectively? My time is up. I just want to say this. The call to follow always involves a call to serve. And sometimes for some people, it also involves a call to leave. Follow one thing, you have to leave something else. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you today for your word. I thank you, God, that you do show up where we work. Lord, that you have the opportunity to be present and to be vocal. And Lord, to make a difference in our lives and in the lives of those that we work with. Lord, help us to be people of excellence, people of character, people with that strong work ethic based on you, Lord God. And Father, I pray also that you'd give us all open ears to hear your calling and your direction, Lord, and where where you want us to go, Lord, and, and how you want us to serve. And Lord, even for some, how you want us to leave everything behind and just follow you in full time service, God. Lord, we want to encounter you at work. We pray you'd help us to do it in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Amen. Praise God. So that's it. Boom. That's the end of the sermon from me. I'm going to turn the pulpit over now to uh, Jerry Ireland. Jerry um, has been serving the Lord of Missions since 2006. Last time he was here at Monroeville was 2011. He and his wife Paula are a wonderful uh, missionary couple. They have a daughter, Karis. Um, Dr. Ireland has served in, um, in Zambia. Am I saying that wrong? I, said, I feel like I'm saying it wrong, Zambia. And then he, um, they, they served as the directors of all the compassion ministries that the Assemblies of God has throughout the continent of Africa. So if you can imagine um, all of that, all the travel and the administration and just the huge needs that exist, and they were, they were overseeing all of those compassion ministries. And now he serves as the vice provost of the theological uh, seminary there in West Africa and Togo. And so they train ministers, people that are already in ministry that are going for masters or doctorates come there. Leaders of, of uh, national movements within the Assemblies of God come there and uh, they're taught by Dr. Ireland. So we are very blessed to have them. They have prayer cards in a table out in the lobby. And so after church, if you could grab one of these and that'll be a reminder for you to lift them up in prayer. I know they would greatly appreciate it. Can you please make... Jerry Ireland, Phil, welcome here today. Good morning. Uh, it's really great to be back at this church. Um, I, my wife and I uh, just love this church, and my, my wife was very disappointed that she didn't get to come on this trip, but she's back in Springfield, Missouri with our, our seven-year-old daughter uh, who has school tomorrow, so, so they're... They're holding down the fort there, but um, it's just great to be in this church. I love that this is a Pentecostal church. Um, I love that this is unapologetically a Pentecostal church because uh, you would be amazed at how many Assemblies of God churches um, are doctrinally Pentecostal, but they're not functionally Pentecostal. Um, And I I just, I thank God for this church because I I know that this is a praying church and that this is a church that that listens to the Holy Spirit and that gives space for the Holy Spirit to move. So um, it's just a real honor and a a pleasure to be here. I do have a message uh, this morning from Exodus chapter 3, so if you want to 
open your Bibles or, or your electronic device to, to Exodus 3. Um, before I get into that, though, um, I want to share with you uh, an opportunity um, that you're going to have a chance to give to at your missions convention that's coming up in about five weeks. Um, and uh, anyway, we'll show the video and then I'll, I'll explain it afterwards. So. My name is Bartholomew, and this is Northern Cameroon, where you will find 15 people groups who have not yet been reached with the gospel. They have never heard his story, known his forgiveness, or witnessed his wonders. Instead, they have lived in darkness and in fear of death, always, for generations uncounted. They have names like the Shua, Bagara, Boduma, and Turku, and they are desperately lost. Daily I live with two questions. How will they hear about Jesus if no one is sent to them? And how can one be sent without proper training? Here is the solution. My school. It is a Bible school for church planters. We are learning to plant new churches and make disciples. From this school, 100 of us go out to surrounding villages to plant new churches. Already, we have a harvest among some of the tribes. This is my church. It is in a village you won't find on any map. When I found it, there were no believers, only those who worshipped idols or followed Allah. I cried out to God, Here, this is the place. These are the people. Will you help me plant your church? God moved immediately. Look at them. Jesus has saved them. Some used to pray to idols or Allah. Now they serve Jesus. Even though they struggle in poverty and life is very hard, they feast on the goodness of God and the peace of knowing Jesus. Because of what I am learning in the church planting school, I can better minister to and disciple these people. But I have much more to learn. That's why our church planting school is so important to us in Northern Cameroon. Without this school, we could not train enough church planters to reach these 15 unreached tribes. We live on a great spiritual frontier in Cameroon. There is much to be done. So many villages need a witness of Jesus. Africa's Hope shares our church planting vision for Northern Cameroon. They promise to tell the churches in America about what is happening here. We say thank you. Your actions will help plant more churches. The best way to reach 15 people groups is to train and send more church planters like me. This is a journey worth taking. In Africa we say, travel alone and you will go fast, but travel together and we will go far. Let's go far together. I, Pastor Bartholomew, and these hundred others want to go reach the Korba, the Fulani, and many others. But we need your help. Will you help plant more churches among these people in Northern Cameroon? As Pastor Lance said, my wife and I have for the last several years overseen compassionate ministry for the continent of Africa which is a huge place. Uh, the continent of Africa can actually fit the United States inside of it three times. Um, it's a very big place. And so very early on in our work in Compassion, we realized that if we were really going to make an impact, that it, it was going to be through training and through empowering and equipping local people um, to, to plant churches that, that function as the salt and light of their communities. And so we've, big, we've transitioned recently to from 
overseeing compassion to being more involved in theological training um, because pastors like Pastor Bartholomew that we just saw there are, are the hope of, of transforming Africa. They're the ones that are going to take, take the gospel to the hardest to reach places all across that continent. And, and to do that, they need theological training. They need the, the tools and equipment um, to be able to, to challenge um, people who believe in Islam and people who have grown up uh, participating in witchcraft for their, their whole lives. And so, um, so we're trying to raise about $20,000. And about 10,000 of that is, to, is towards our building facilities, which needs some, some improvements. And then the rest of it is for scholarships uh, for, for needy pastors. And so I, I just want to thank you in advance uh, for giving to that. Um, and uh, thank you for your prayers. And um, uh, keep the prayers coming because we, we desperately need them. So Exodus chapter 3. And I want to talk about the call of God this morning. Exodus chapter 3 verse 1 says, Now Moses was pastoring the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire in the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed." And so Moses said, I must turn aside and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When the, Lord, when the Lord saw that he turned aside, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And then he said, do not come near here, but remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And then he also said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid. And then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me, and I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt. And God said, certainly I will be with you. And this shall be a sign that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. And then Moses said to God, behold, I'm going to Israel and I will say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say, what is his name and what shall I say? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. As we talk about the call of God this morning, I want to take a, just a minute and um, clarify some things because I, I think often in the church we, we continue to look at the call of God simply as something that applies to sort of a select few within the church. We think that the pastor is called and the worship team is called and um, missionaries are called and chaplains are called. Um, but I want to say this morning that every single person in this church has a calling upon your life. Every single one of us are called by God. And so that means that, you can, that being a nurse can be a calling, or, or being a, a barista at Starbucks can be a calling, or, or being a, a construction worker, or a truck driver, or a lawyer, or doctor. All of those things can be a calling because you can be, as Pastor Lance just explained, you can be the presence of God in those places. You may be the only light in those places. But sometimes, I think when it comes to to the call of God, we get caught up, one of the, or one of the biggest lies or misconceptions that we, that we tell ourselves about the call of God is that our yes to God depends on what we can or cannot do. 
And this morning, I want to suggest that saying yes to the call of God has very little to do with what we can or cannot do, and it has everything to do with who God is. And so this morning, I, I want to give you four qualities of God that will help us to say yes to the things that God is calling us to do. Number one, he's the God who occupies the ordinary. He's the God who occupies the ordinary. In the beginning of this, this passage of Scripture we just read, Moses was out doing something very ordinary. He was just out pasturing a flock of sheep, sheep, something that he probably did every single day of his life. And that was where God showed up. And that reminds us that, that God can show up in the midst of our everyday circumstances. God can show up while you're mowing the lawn or while you're washing dishes or doing laundry or, or the thousands of other things that we do all the time while you're driving to work. God can show up in the midst of those circumstances. But not only was Moses going about a very ordinary routine, but God speaks to Moses out of a very ordinary object. I mean, it's a bush. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't get any more ordinary or uninteresting than a bush. <laughs> one, one commentator said, you know, Moses, God, if he wanted to, could have lit the whole mountainside on fire, but instead he, he speaks to Moses from out of a single, common, everyday, ordinary bush. And in doing so, it foretells of the fact that God is going to use a common, ordinary, everyday person like Moses and a common, ordinary, everyday people like the nation of Israel to accomplish his purposes. And God uses common, ordinary, everyday people just like you and me to accomplish his purposes. When we were in Zambia, we, we had a friend uh, by the name of Frida Mulenga, and she was a, a poor widow. She, she lives in a tiny shack. She, she doesn't have much money. She lives day to day. Um, and uh, one day she was walking through the market in, in the, the town where she lives, and she came across a, a crowd of people that were gathered around, and they were laughing and cheering. And, and so Mrs. Malenga, she sort of pushed her way through the crowd to see what was happening, and she got there, and um, in the dirt there, lying in the middle of the crowd was a, a naked man who was having convulsions. And this is actually not an uncommon sight in Africa because in many places in Africa, people are involved in witchcraft from the, the time they're, they're born. And so by the time they get to be adults, um, often you, you see people who've just lost touch with reality, people who are kind of like the demoniacs that we read about in the, in the Gospels, people um, who just uh, are, are unrestrainable. Uh, and this man was here, and he was lying uh, in the dirt, and he was having convulsions, and there was this whole crowd of people standing around just laughing and mocking this guy. And, and in the midst of that, God spoke to this poor widow, to Mrs. Malenga, and said, I want you to help this man. And so she walked a few blocks up the, the street to a, her AG church, and she got some friends, and then they went and got a wheelbarrow, and they came back, and in Africa, women wear brightly colored fabric wrapped around their waist. Uh, it's true in just about every country in Africa. In Zambia, they call it a chitenge. And she took the chitenge cloth that she was wearing, and, and they used this to carry their babies or carry firewood or to sit on, or they use it for a thousand different things. But she took, took this chitenge cloth, and they covered the man up, and they picked him up, and they put him in the wheelbarrow, and they took him to the, a clinic up the road. And when they got to the clinic, the, the operators of the clinic said, I'm sorry, you can't bring that man in here. We don't see people like that. And this gentle, humble widow who just loves Jesus looked back at these people and she said, no. She said, this man is made in the image of God and we're not leaving until you see him. And she sat down in the waiting room. Well, several hours went by and Several more hours went by, and finally, as the clinic cleared out, they said, okay, fine, bring him in. And they, they brought him in, and they gave him a room. And, and this man died in that, that clinic that night. But instead of literally dying in a, lying in a gutter with a crowd of strangers mocking him, he died with dignity. 
He died with the church, holding his hand, praying over him, singing hymns, because a widow who lives day to day dared to believe that God was speaking to her out of the ordinary circumstances of her everyday life and dared to believe that God could use somebody like her. God speaks to us in the midst of our ordinary circumstances and he calls us in our own ordinariness to be a part of what he's doing. Number two, God is a holy God. You know, as Moses began to approach this burning bush, God sort of puts the brakes on and says, hold it right there, don't come any closer because the ground that you're walking on is holy ground. And in doing this, God was teaching Moses a very important lesson. God was teaching Moses not to become casual and presumptive about the presence of God. In other words, God was saying, listen, Moses, I'm going to do some amazing things through you. And God would do some amazing things through Moses. If you look at the course of his life and the ways that God used him and the miracles that, that were wrought through him and, and the ways that God used him to lead the nation of Israel, it's amazing. But God wanted to remind Moses that no matter what great and mighty ways that I use you, don't ever forget that I'm God and you're not. And that sounds like a really simple thing. But the truth is, is that an awful lot of great men and women of God have lost their way because they forgot that one thing. You see, when we become casual and presumptive about the presence of God, we, we begin to think that the churches that we pastor belong to us. Or we begin to think that the ministry roles that we have are owed to us. When, when we become casual and presumptive about uh, the presence of God, we inevitably think too highly of ourselves and too little of God. God is a holy God. And there's this sort of duality at work when it comes to the holy presence of God. And it's this, it's that, that not only do we have to have this reverential awe for, for the power and the presence of God, but we, we need the power and presence of God to do the things that God has called us to do. I have never had a single day in ministry where I got up and, and felt like, God, I can do this without you today. <laughs> not once. <laughs> Every single day I wake up and feel like I'm in way over my head. <laughs> And that's a great place to be in ministry. It's a great place to be in life because it makes me pray a lot. <laughs> when we were itinerating back in, in 2007, we had gone through the season of, of about six months where we were, we were on the road constantly. We were in churches Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night, and we were in home groups. And, and we, every time the church doors were open, we were there trying to, trying to get our budget raised. And for about six months, though, we didn't get a single pledge. And we, we just said one day, we said, you know what, let's just set aside a day. And so we set aside a Saturday to pray and fast and, and just, just meet with God and see what was and just call out to God and see what God might do. And so we set aside this Saturday, and my wife, is she's very musically gifted. She plays the ukulele and the banjo and the guitar and the keyboards, and um, I don't play any of that. Um, in fact, I'm so musically uninclined that not long ago we were having our, our family devotions, and my, my seven-year-old daughter uh, looks up at me and she says, Daddy, she says, maybe when we, we sing songs, maybe you can just move your lips and not make any noise. <laughs> so, so I have zero musical ability, and my daughter was right to recognize that. But my wife is very gifted, and so that morning she got out the guitar and just started to play, and we just started to worship. And we probably weren't doing that for 15 minutes when the Holy Spirit just fell on the room and you could just feel God's presence and we both just began to weep. We just began to sob. We just began to cry out to God and, and all of a sudden I began to prophesy and I, I don't do that often. I, I've done it a handful of times in, in 13 years of, of ministry. But I just began to prophesy and say, it's time to go. It's time to go. It's time to go. And I knew that God was telling us it was time to go to Africa. Then when, 
when we settled down and, and the dust settled and we, were, we finished our prayer time, we kind of looked at each other and thought, well, what does that mean? Because clearly God just spoke to us. We knew that, that God's presence was there, but we still had this big chunk of money we had to raise before we could go. Before the sun set on that Saturday, we had over $300 come in in monthly support. Within 10 days, our entire remaining budget came in without us making a single phone call. And all of that happened, I'm convinced, because God wanted us to know um, what Moses knew when he said, God, if your presence doesn't go with us, we don't want to go. And God was telling us that accomplishing the things that God has called us to do has very little to do with who we are and everything to do with who He is. You see, when, when the Holy Spirit comes, God does things that are bigger than you and I can imagine. <laughs> Holy Spirit gives us breakthroughs when we need a breakthrough. We have to create space, as Pastor Lance was talking about in this. We have to create space in our lives to seek and to, to pursue the presence of God. And if Africa has taught me anything, it's taught me how to pray. Number three, God is a caring God. The whole reason that God called Moses was because God's people were suffering under the oppression of an evil ruler. Verse 7 says, I have seen the affliction of my people who were in Egypt, and I have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, and I'm aware of their suffering. Notice there's a threefold response of God. He sees, he hears, and he becomes aware. And I am convinced that often we don't respond to the call of God because we don't see, we don't hear, and we choose to remain unaware of the, the needs around us. But a broken heart is a prerequisite for ministering to a broken world. I, I was saved through the ministry of Teen Challenge. Um, and so I often tell people that I have a lot in common with the Apostle Paul because we, we both got stoned and got thrown in jail. Um, but that's another story for a, another sermon. You'll have to invite me back to tell that one. Um, but I got saved through the ministry of Teen Challenge. And when I went into Teen Challenge, I didn't know where I stood on the whole God thing. I was... Somewhere between atheism and agnosticism, um, depending on which day of the week it was. But I was, I can tell you this, I was very angry at this God that I didn't believe in. Um, but I went into Teen Challenge, and there was this, I was at the Buffalo Teen Challenge, and there was this couple, Paul and Norma Weber, who every other Saturday, so two Saturdays out of every month, all year round, invited the entire Buffalo Men's Teen Challenge into their home. And they would cook hot dogs and macaroni and cheese every Saturday. And we would sit around and we would watch Gaither videos and I didn't know who the Gaithers were and honestly I was a little bit confused about them at first. I was like, why does everybody have big hair and why is it a homecoming? Like, are they a football team or I don't get it. But we would sit around and we would watch Gaither videos and we would, we would eat macaroni and cheese and hot dogs. And, and I remember watching this couple and I remember thinking, you know, what's in it for them? Like, what are they getting out of this? Because the world that I came from, nobody just does things for you unless they want something out of you. And I just watched these people and I thought, there, there's got to, I mean, I, I rem remember thinking, are these people insane? Do they not have any idea what we were doing before we got here? Um, and they, they bring us into their home every weekend, every other weekend. And I just watched them and, and I realized after watching them for several, several weeks, I realized that the only thing that they got out of it was that they got to love a whole segment of society that the rest of the world had written off as hopeless. And I remember saying to myself, these people have something. I don't know what it is, but they have something that very few people I've ever met in my life have. 
and whatever it is, I want it. And that was the beginning of my journey to Christ. God cares, and He calls upon us to be a people who care. And then finally, He's the God who is. All through these opening chapters of of Exodus, we see Moses wrestling with the things that God has called him to do. And in the beginning of chapter 4, Moses begins to complain to God and say, God, I'm not a good public speaker. You're asking me to do things that I don't have the gifts to do. And, and you see God kind of getting fed up with Moses, telling him what he can't do. Because the point is, is that we can relax about what we're not because we serve a God whose name is I am. And that's important for a couple of reasons. Number one, you cannot effectively respond to the call of God if your confidence is in yourself. And second, understanding the greatness of God frees us to just obey and leave the results to God. If the results of my ministry were dependent on me, I would have left years ago. But my I can't save anybody, but I can share the gospel. And it's up to God to bring the results. We plant the seeds, God brings the harvest. In other words, the godness of God will always be sufficient for you and I to do what God is calling us to do. The world that we live in is very good at reminding us of what we're not. We're not eloquent enough or we're not... Um, we're not rich enough, or we're not this, we're not that. We're, the world's constantly bombarding us with this idea that, that we're not good enough or that we don't measure up to, the, to certain standards. And I just want to remind you this morning that making miracles out of not enough is sort of what God does. That's his specialty. That's why the widow's oil never ran out. That's why God reduced Gideon's army from 22,000 to 300. Because God's specialty is making miracles out of not enough. That's why Jesus fed the multitude with a fish sandwich and had more left over than they had to begin with because God's specialty is making miracles out of not enough. When I was a, a student at Valley Forge, my second semester there, I was getting ready to start school and I, I, was, um, I was short my tuition. And so I went to my parents and, and I said, hey, I'm a little bit short for tuition for the semester. Can you guys help me out? And my mom kind of shocked me and, and she said, well, son, let me pray about it. And, and I, I was like, mom, six months ago I was a drug addict and now I want to go to Bible college. What's there to pray about? You know, it's like this, this is not rocket science. But thank God for mothers who pray. Thank God for mothers who pray and who listen to the voice of God because my mother prayed and she came back and she said, I don't know why, but I just feel like I'm not supposed to give you this money. And I knew that God had called me to Bible school, so I, I went ahead and went back to, to Valley Forge, and I got there, and on the day of registration, I'm going through the whole check-in process, and I, I get to the financial aid check-in, and I walk up, and the lady there, she pulls out my file, and she says, okay, so you owe so and such and such an amount. How do you want to pay? And I said, that's a really good question. <laughs> and just as I said that, the phone rang, she answers the phone and she talks for a few minutes and then she comes back and she said, um, she said, I think God must really want you here. She said, because that phone call was a student who was coming who had a scholarship, but they just called to say they're not going to come. So that scholarship has been freed up. And she said, so since I'm the director of financial aid, why don't I just give you the scholarship? I said, that's a good idea. <laughs> Making miracles out of not enough is what God does. I have never for one day, and I want to invite the worship team to come up, I have never for one day doubted that God called me to ministry because of that incident. But it never would have happened if my mother had given me the money. Sometimes our lack of resources and genuine need is the opportunity for God to do a miracle. 
Lack of resources and genuine need is often the place where, where God shows up and does something that, that is above and beyond what we could ask or imagine because God wants to remind us that He's God, that He's sovereign, that He can do whatever He wants to do, that His will is not dependent on money or resources or buildings or even our gifts or talents, that God can do what God wants to do. I just want to challenge you this morning as we close and go into a, a time of um, just a response. Maybe God is calling some of you to, to just step out and, and go to a place that, that maybe you've never even heard of. Today in missions, we need people who are doctors, builders, nurses, computer experts, IT people. The, I could go all day listing the kinds of professions that we need in missions. It's, not, it's no longer the day where missionaries are just preachers. We need people of every kind of expertise you can imagine. And I just want to challenge you this morning that, that God might be speaking to you in the midst of your ordinary, everyday circumstances and saying, I want to use you. I want to use you in ways that you haven't yet even begun to imagine. And some of you, maybe God is calling you to stay right where you're at, but he's calling you to step out in, in greater ways and share your faith to your neighbors or to your coworkers. He's calling you to, to trust him, not because you're you're an eloquent speaker or because you've got it all figured out, but because he's sovereign and the Holy Spirit goes before us and prepares the way. Pastor Lance. I hope you were listening. I hope you were listening. There's some powerful truth there and there's some unforgettable illustrations. There. Amen. Amen. God, let's stand to our feet. Um, Willie and the team are going to just run through uh, another song. We're going to open the altars right now. And um, we just this weekend, we just had a lot of people just need to come forward and say, God, um, here I am. Lord, I'm available. God, speak to me. And just by, you know, we can say it, but just something about moving forward to the altar and kind of presenting yourself as a living sacrifice and you saying, here I am, Lord, use my life however you want to uh, you want to do so. So just encourage you, young and old, to, to just begin to make your way forward and find a place of prayer as we go into this last song. I'm just going to say a brief closing prayer, and then, um, you know, as you, as you need to go, feel free. Um, if you want to stay and linger for a while, you're welcome to do that as well. Lord, we love you, and we just thank you for the fact that, that you are God, and, and we're reminded of that today, that you are the one true God, and we're just your followers, Lord God. But what a privilege we have that you choose to use us, Lord God. You choose to involve us in what you're doing. It's such a privilege, Lord. It's just, it's beyond imagining, God. And so, Lord, we just thank you today for the openness, the willingness, God, that our ears are open to your call, Lord God. Our lives are available for your use, God. Send us where you will. Have us to do what you will. Have us to say what you will, God. We submit to your will and your plan today. In Jesus' name, everybody said. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So altars are open. Feel free to come. Feel free to go.